You're listening to the Ortho K podcast. The Ortho K podcast is sponsored by the Ortho Keratology Academy of America. Go to www.orthokacademy.com. The topic of our last podcast was marketing and featured Dr. Nick Despeditis as my guest host. We continue with that theme in this episode with Nick speaking to Dr. Kyle Jones about how he was able to overcome some of the specific challenges that he has faced in building his ortho K practice. So Nick, what can you tell us about Kyle and what was it about him and his practice that made you want to interview him for this podcast? I've known Kyle since he attended the Supercharge course at about four or five years ago. And what I remembered about him and the reason I selected him, he was taking copious notes for four hours plus. No breaks, he was taking notes. And he followed up with me. What makes Kyle different, the reason why I chose to, to interview him, he hasn't based his practice on an Asian population. A lot of people mistakenly feel ortho K is an Asian-based uh, modality. And a lot of times it is. But Kyle has developed a, a very a nice private practice using ortho K as a very profitable submodality. And it evolved from v- fitting specialty contact lenses well before he embraced ortho K. He sh- has shown resilience, this guy. He has a competitor that it's opened up literally across the street from him. Competitor meaning an optometrist who offers the core commodities that a lot of us do, glasses, contacts, and Kyle has prospered uh, in front of that challenge. He uh, participates in a lot of plans and realized that's not the future of his practice. He enjoys speaking and promoting ortho K and myopia control. Uh, what I found fascinating, and, and Eileen Lowe from last month said the same thing. He enjoys the challenge of fitting these lenses. He really does, as well as the personal satisfaction of helping patients. Um, And lastly, lastly, he says, private practice is not for wimps. And he displays that resilience by continually fighting, if you will, to promote this this ortho case side of his practice. And and that's why I've chosen the, the The kid, I'll call him kid, he's not that much of a kid, but he has fought through it and has prospered. So I hope your listeners really benefit from his experiences. That sounds great, Nick. Uh, So without any further ado, here is Nick speaking to Dr. Kyle Jones. Well, today I'm speaking with uh, Dr. Kyle Jones. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing Kyle for approximately four years now. Kyle, how long have we known one another? It's about four years. Four years. Yes, it's about four years. And uh, what I admire most about Kyle is his indomitable spirit. He had taken one of my courses, and afterwards, uh, he was one of the few attendees that would email me, ask me very pertinent questions, not how-to questions. He was asking me, listen, I've done this and that. And I've gotten so far, can you give me a hint? Can you give me a tip on how to go further? So it's my privilege to interview Kyle. Uh, Kyle, welcome to today's interview. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Great. Well, let's start. Why don't you tell me a little bit about your practice, how long you've been in practice, where do you practice, those kind of, kind of demographics? I'd be happy to. Um, I've been practicing optometry for about 15 years, and I've been in private practice for about the last 12, um, I'm in a suburb of Atlanta and in a middle-class neighborhood. I've got a nice mix of patient demographics, young, old, um, everything in between. It's a lot of fun. Great. Well, tell me a little bit about why you've decided to focus on corny reshaping. Well, you know, it's, what's interesting is I've been seeing patients with irregular corneas for years. A lot of uh, post-op LASIK patients, a lot of uh, RK patients, and a lot of people that just didn't get great results. Um, and in addition to that, when I saw these folks having problems, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a way for us 
to kind of get the same results, but in a non-surgical way. And back in about 2003 or 2004, a friend of mine introduced me to coin over shaping. And as soon as I heard about it, I fell in love with it. And I thought, this is exactly what I've been looking for. This is the direction I want to take my practice in. So let me get this straight. You have a multidisciplinary practice. Do you do you, do you sell eyeglasses? Do you do uh, medical therapeutics, or do you just do uh, specialty contact lenses? Actually, my practice is uh, a primary care practice. So I do um, I do ortho K. I do specialty contact lenses, but I also do regular primary care. I see patients for eye exams, soft disposable contact lenses, eye infections, glaucoma, the gamut. I run the gamut in my practice, but I have a special interest and emphasis on specialty contact lenses. All right, so tell me a little bit about your typical ortho K patient, the demographic, the age, the culture, etc. Most of my ortho K patients are kids. Um, my youngest ortho K patient is about eight years old, and I'd say my oldest one, well, my oldest ortho K patient is about 62. Um, but mm-hmm. mo- my practice skews mostly. Um, adolescents to teenagers, and um, what I have is what's interesting is that some of my specialty patients, my minus 10s, my minus 12s, they come into my office, and they look at me, and they say, I'm worried about my son or daughter becoming as nearsighted as I am. I wish there was a way that we could keep his eyes from getting worse, and it's a wonderful way for me to segue or turn the conversation towards ortho K. And that's really what I've been relying upon uh, to help grow that aspect of the practice. Is there a particular culture? The people I've interviewed have told me their practice, their ortho K practice, is based on an Asian culture. How about your demographic? No, um, I've got. I don't have many Asian patients in my practice. Or, or more importantly, I don't have many Asian patients who are doing ortho K. Um, it's everybody else. It's my um, my Caucasian patients, my African American patients, uh, Southeast Asians, um, but not folks from predominantly, you know, China um, or the Pacific Rim. So, in your opinion, it's definitely possible to develop a practice that's not based on an Asian uh, demographic, if you will. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think it's really more of a function of uh, educating your patient base and making them aware of the fact that this is a service that's available. I think the biggest uh, obstacle to overcome with ortho K is just getting the word out and then developing enough momentum where your patients are starting to refer or, uh, refer themselves to your practice. Okay, here's the key. This is why I'm doing the, these, these podcasts, if you will. You said it's just getting the word out. But it takes a lot more than that. And the reason I selected you is we've been communicating back and forth for several years. Where does your perseverance come from? Because I know it hasn't been easy from you. I know you lecture. I know you do a lot of things to drum the the beat out there to get people interested in this modality. Tell me a little bit about the hard work you've done to develop a practice, a specialty practice. That's a great question, and you're absolutely right. There's nothing easy about developing an ortho-K practice. Um, I spend a lot of time doing a number of different things. Um, I go out and I do dinner lectures where I'll invite the population in and around my practice to come in. I provide dinner, and I talk to them about ortho-K. Um, I search and I mine my practice database to find patients based on age and prescriptions. I send out mailings. Um, I'm constantly talking about ortho-K to my patients in the office. Um, And I've been doing this now, I think I got certified for CRT back in 2004. It really didn't take off until I took my first uh, supercharge uh, lecture with you, where I really understood the importance of developing uh, systems and processes but this is this is not easy. It takes a lot of time and a lot of dedication. That's right, and a lot of hard, hard work. But in private practice, I remember emailing you. I remember this specifically. And what turned me on to you is you said a very profound quote. 
private practice is not for wimps. No, it's not. Can you expand on that? Because you weren't talking about ortho K. You were just saying, hey, listen, Nick, this is hard work. I appreciate that. But private practice in general is not for wimps. What were you alluding to? A number of different things. Um, my practice is literally surrounded by other practices, uh, mostly chains. Um, there may be five or six chains uh, less than a mile away from my practice, so there's a lot of competition. Um, there's always a fire that needs to be put out. Um, in addition to that, there's audits by the various vision uh, care plans where they want me to you know, give up records and financial information so that patients who saw me, um, there's a patient that's coming in that has a problem, they can't see out of their glasses, on and on and on. And there's just this constant pressure on practitioners. And it's not getting easier. The insurance companies aren't writing us bigger checks. They aren't paying us more money. Um, and honestly, one of the reasons why I looked into corneal reshaping and ortho K is for a number of different reasons. One, I enjoyed the intellectual exercise of figuring out how to make this work. I get a warm fuzzy. I know you do too. When you get a patient who's a minus six or a minus seven and they take out their lenses the next morning and they're seeing 2020, I enjoy that feeling. Uh, I enjoy that rush that it gives me. And quite honestly, I'm also tired of living VSP check to VSP check. The insurance companies aren't working. They're not on our, they're not in our corners. So one of the things that motivates me, one of the things um, that drove me to that realization that private practice isn't for wimps is just all the different pressures that are being, uh, that we're being exposed to, whether it's a vision care plan, whether it's competition, whether it's dealing with our patients. All of these things were, are, are pressures. And one day I just kind of sat back in my chair and I said, man, this is this is not for wins. This is not easy. This is serious business, and that's where I was when I when I made that statement. And, and really, you're right because when we're at the mercy of insurance companies, at least for me, I feel like a technician because there was a time in in my practice we where we accepted many health insurances and many eyeglass plans, and it took me several years to realize. I went into private practice for my own autonomy. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to make my own decisions. But I quickly learned I was just a pawn. I just felt like a technician working for the insurance companies. And you're right. At times, ortho K is extremely challenging. The marketing, the patient fulfillment, the, the problems you encounter with staffing, etc., but I persevere because at least I feel I'm being rewarded for the hard work I'm putting into it. And that's what turned me on to your statement. I absolutely enjoy, there is most certainly a rewarding feeling that I get every time I talk to an ortho K patient who's happy with their experience. And that's one of the things that absolutely allows me to persevere. Or when you have a patient who comes in and their parents are a minus 10 and their kid is 8 years old and he's a minus 4. And, you know, normally 15 years ago, 14 years ago, when I started practicing, if a patient came in and their prescription kept increasing year after year, I kind of looked at it with a type of benign neglect. Uh, but now with corneal reshaping, ortho K lenses, I can slow and stop the patient's progression. That provides me with a great sense of fulfillment and obviously with the patient as well. And as I continue to grow this segment of my practice, I can drop these poor paying plans. I can differentiate myself from my competition. I can spend more time with these patients and get fulfillment on multiple levels. So I'm really enjoying private practice in spite of the fact that there's increased competition with the chains and increased um, or decreased reimbursement from the vision care plans and all of these things that are going on. I'm actually happy to be practicing today. But I want you to share, the, the reason I'm doing this, I want to get really down and truthful. How easy is it to drop these crappy plants? Oh, because I remember yelling at you almost through the computer before the days of Skype and saying, what are you waiting for? It's not easy at all. And quite honestly, a lot of it is fear. Yep. Um, yep. Where, where am I going to be if I drop this plan? I have ex-patients that have 
this plan, and if I drop it, they're not going to come and see me anymore. Where's that money going to be? Um, fourth quarter, historically, in my practice, is very slow. That's right. And dropping some of these poor paying plans during the slowest season imaginable, it, it fills me with fear. But when you do it, you also commit to growing that side of the practice. And there's always going to be something else for someone to do with that time, whether it's, you know, making happy calls to your ortho K patients or figure another aspect of marketing to increase the number of patients to come in or doing a dinner lecture or doing a lunch and learn in someone's business and talking to them about ortho K or even talking to them about visual hygiene uh, in the office place, ergonomics. There are definitely ways that you can use the time that you gain from not seeing these crappier plans uh, to help grow your practice. Absolutely. Um, it's hard. I, it, there's nothing easy about making the decision, but it's, it's rewarding afterwards. I, um, and I honestly, I don't think any of these vision plans are doing us any kind of service. They talk about it. They pay lip service to it, but it seems year after year, they just continue to find ways to decrease reimbursement. Yeah, they're, they're in it for making a profit like we all are. But I want to get through to the audience and to the members. There's just no success without commitment. And there's no success without sacrifice. And unfortunately, the majority of people listening won't pull the trigger and drop the plans that their staff is telling them to drop. Uh, You know, they're just not going to take the step forward. And that's why I commend you. And that's why we're speaking today. Well, I'll tell you what, my, you talk about mantras, um, private practice not being for wimps. My other mantra is I hate insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> and my staff, are, and my staff, um, they feel the same way. So as we see more and more ortho K patients, you know, they're, they're counting down the days. Like we have a checklist of which insurance company we're going to cross off next. Which one are we going to stop taking? And what, and what level of profitability do we need to be? How many ortho K patients do we need to see a week, a month in order to be able to drop plan X so that, so that we don't have to deal with their administrative headache? Um, and it seems every day there's another insurance. I just got audited by Davis Visions last week. And now with Obamacare, uh, basically a lot of the insurance companies are using Davis to fulfill their eyeglass or vision aspect of their medical insurance, like Horizon. So I don't want to kill a dead horse, but I I don't want to skim over it. You can't have both because I'll hear practitioners say, well, I'll keep these vision plans, I'll keep busy, but I also want to be profitable. They're totally different things. Do you want to be busy or do you want to be fulfilled? And they're two totally different things. It's very challenging to do exams profitably. Um, vision plan, vision care plan X may reimburse me $55 for an eye exam, give me a $20 dispensing fee. I have to see a lot of those patients in order to, you know, keep the lights on. But if I can see two or three ortho K patients a month, I can offset that income and I can dedicate appointment slots in my schedule so I'm not trying to squeeze them in between other patients. You're absolutely right. It's a hard juggling act. Um, But once you commit, uh, it's a little scary at first, but as you start to transition, I definitely think it's better. I I absolutely, uh, I look forward to dropping each insurance plan. It's, It's one of the other things that I look forward to every day when I go to work. And I could tell you firsthand, we dropped our last vision plan in 2001, so 12 years ago. We've never looked back. And I could tell you, you'll never look back. Was it easy? It was damn hard. Did we lose money in the beginning? Yes, we did. But let me tell you something. It was quicksand, and we knew it was quicksand early on, and we just developed the fortitude to drop these plans despite that, and we've never looked back. I want to talk about what is your greatest challenge in developing a specialty practice like an ortho K practice? We, we can, let's believe you that it's rewarding, it's fulfilling. Let's believe you that it's allowed you to practice the way you want to practice. 
But tell me what's your biggest challenge in growing it further? Uh, honestly, um, the first part was what we just talked about, was fear. The second part, and this one is probably my biggest uh, challenge, and it's one I struggle with daily to try to overcome, uh, is fear of rejection. Um, and it's it's almost comical in the sense, that, and we've talked about this, where, you know, success and fear of rejection are kind of incompatible. That's correct. Um, you know, you can't say, I want to climb Mount Everest, but I'm afraid of heights. That's uh, correct. It, it, it doesn't work. So, um, and I remember in your supercharged lecture, one of the things that kind of helped me get through that was you said for every 40 patients that you talk to about Ortho K, only about um, one patient for every 40 that you talk That's to. That's correct. Takes, decides to sign on board with you. And I was like, okay, well, if, you know, uh, Dr. Nick is doing this and he's performing at this level and he still gets, you know, 39 rejections out of 40, then I can do this. And it's a numbers game. Uh, and I'm passionate about it. And yet only one in 40 of my own patients will follow through to a consultation. But anybody who has a successful specialty practice like OrthoK will tell you that one person that does transfer into an OrthoK patient will refer several others. So you remember the wheel story that I used to tell? I do. About getting that big wheel to start turning. Why don't you just review that a little bit? Because I remember you regurgitating that to me, if you will, where, you know, you often thought about this analogy of trying to get this big, heavy wheel to turn. I'd be happy to. Uh, and in fact, truer words have never been spoken. It takes a long time to get people to start signing on with Ortho K. And it's, in some ways, it's almost comical because you can talk to a patient and say, hey, have we ever talked about ortho K? And they'll say, <laughs> no. And you're like, I just spoke to you last year about it. And then, and then there are times where I'm examining a patient and I get ready to get up and dismiss them. And they say, well, hold on a minute, Dr. Jones. Uh, you know, those lenses that you talked to me about that, you know, they sleep in and fix your vision. I think I'm ready to do that now. And then, you know, you'll wow the patient with the results. And then the next thing you know, you'll get, you know, it, it may be a month or two later, it could be six months later. Another patient will walk in and say, hey, you know, I spoke to so-and-so and their kid is wearing these lenses that they sleep in at night. I'd like to learn more about it. So um, one of my, uh, I love listening to self-help gurus. And one of my favorite is a guy by the name of John Maxwell. In a book, one of his uh, books that I like is the 21 uh, Mutable Laws of uh, Leadership. And he talks about something called um, the Big Mo. And he's talking about momentum. And, okay. and it's like your wheel analogy. It's this huge wheel or a millstone. And it takes a lot of energy and effort to get it turning. But once you do, and that moment, momentum starts to take over for you, you start to get those referrals coming in, and they don't come as fast as you like them to, and they're not as and they're not as consistent as you'd like for them to. But it happens, and when it does, it feels really good. But then the the important part of that is it's not time to stop. Like when you start getting all those referrals coming in, that's when you really need to continue to press so that when you do get to your slow season, you're still enjoying the benefits of those referrals. But absolutely, it's hard work. It's not going to happen overnight. I've been pushing really hard with Ortho K now for about four, three or four years. And I'm just starting to see some of the folks that I spoke to in 2010, 2011 about it. There's a incubation period, if you will, for Ortho K patients where you plant the seed of the idea in their mind. And, you know, some of them come back the next year after they set up their flexible spending accounts or what have you. But, that that layover period, that incubation period takes a little bit of time, but then you see them back. But absolutely, it, it's it's not easy, and it doesn't happen fast. It's like anything else in life. There's no overnight successes. All right, well, that was great, Nick. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to Kyle about some of the challenges he's faced in his ortho K practice. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No. Yeah, what I found most motivating uh, on my side is that he enjoys the challenge so much that really fuels his indomitable spirit of not giving up and just keep 
keep working until he reaches the success that he wants. And he has. He really has. And that success translates to a more, more fulfilling lifestyle, I think. That's what this is all about. Very good. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. You've been listening to the Ortho K Podcast. Brought to you by the Orthokeratology Academy of America. Go to www.orthokacademy.com. The music for this episode was done by Meredith Wilson and is used with permission.